What would you do if you found a massive organism? One that reached deep into the mantle of the earth, made of flesh and blood and digestive juice. So much digestive juice. A being that defies all our known biological and geological ideas and is seemingly in a state of hibernation. Well, if you are a member of the Anodyne Corporation, you'd make a profit from it. Hello folks, today we're talking about the Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, and a lot of people have talked about it before me. There's a good, if long, video by the wonderful channel Wendigoon if you want a much more thorough examination of the literal happenings of the Flesh Pit. You can go there. I, however, have a bit of a different plan. It does require a quick rundown of the Mystery Flesh Pit. It started as a few random posts that had a much more strange and occult vibe, one that it has abandoned in favor of the scientific and geobiological tone it now maintains. It follows the exploits of a company and the United States government and their attempts to control, contain, and profit off of a massive creature that exists under the Permian Basin, called, appropriately enough, the Permian Basin Superorganism. This includes, or included, its transition into a national park site, the titular Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. The various strange technologies and products created by the Anodyne Corporation, the disasters that led to the closure of the park, with a good sprinkling of genuinely unsettling body horror. I want to just give you a taste of that. When the pit was first discovered, it was through oil drilling that churned through something big. It was explored by people who wormed their way through flesh and viscera, and they decided to construct things within it. A visitor's center, mining rigs, things known as dilation anchors to keep the mouth open, and run electrical cables through it so that they could support life underground human life at least, creatures were found inside, copiapods, macrobacteria, things that lived in the folds of flesh and fed on the juices of a living cave. It wasn't producing the organisms. No, some of them evolved from a life that we would recognize. The harsh conditions of the flesh pit forced evolutionary pressure, like that of a cave-dwelling creature, loss of pigmentation and eyesight. But the flesh pit, unlike a cave, is abounding in food, so you don't need to move all that much. What good are all those muscles? And when all you have to do is find a nice crevice and hide, you find that teeth and bones are useless dead weight. And thus we get the amorphous shame, related to the weasel, but more like a sack of fat and viscera that snuggles itself into a fold in the wall, and lives less like a mammal and more like an oral bacteria. Or then amalgamations, in which animals, and in very rare cases, I swear, ve very sw rare cases, I swear, very rare, people get stuck within the digestive chambers of the organism, and through unknown processes meld and fuse together, their bodies melting into a soup of twitching limbs. One example of this involved a troop of performers who were in the pit and fell into an unknown, non-reinforced section. It happened to be a digestive section. They were found melded, digesting in agony, and to try to stop the acidic effects, the rescue team applied an experimental solution. The resulting chemical reaction basically caked the workers in quick-dry concrete. Of course, they're now a tourist attraction. The flesh pit is already such a macabre attraction. Why not sell death within it as well? The theme of the corporation using experimental solutions to try to cut corners to disastrous effect is a big one in the series. There's actually a lot of frank discussion about the flesh pit and how it relates to capitalism, the government of the United States, and human systems at large. 
you can read the entire series of The Flesh Pit as an exaggerated depiction of governmental failure and profit being put before people, and the horrible consequences it has for the world. Something that struck me as I was reading about The Flesh Pit was that a good majority of its workers are apparently most likely temporary migrants. I first saw this image, a blood-stained, decaying personnel information card that referred to the migrant worker program. And then there is this sign that details the various workers, scientists, rangers, surveyors, park staff who will bring you on interactive guided tours. But there's one that stood out to me, the laborer. It all but outright confirms what I said before, because the description text reads building things inside the mystery flesh pit is a tough job thankfully these hard-working operaros are happy to work in some of the messiest part of the pit in order to provide a better life for their families habla espanol this of course is part of a sad reality one of the human systems that has been incorporated into the world of the flesh pit in our world the one hopefully without a flesh pit Migrant workers are often working the dirtiest and most thankless jobs, from backbreaking farm work to dangerous construction work, people without much of a choice in employment due to not having the right scraps of paper, often do the kind of work that can get you injured. They are oftentimes chewed up by a grinding system that, that will hurt them, deport them if they don't show up to work, and maybe will kill them and the migrant laborers of the flesh pit are quite literally chewed up and eaten. Working in the flesh pit is incredibly dangerous. One piece of long-form text is a letter written by a former flesh miner, Andre Martinez, to a child doing a school project, something about seeking career advice. In it, Andre directly correlates experience with injury, loss of life and limb. He talks about how he was extremely lucky not to lose a body part to the pit as he extracted biological deposits of mineral for the company profit. His advice to the kid? Stay the hell away from it. The flesh pit itself is heavily corporatized when anodyne has control over it. Miners and technicians are constantly extracting from it, burrowing through muscle and flesh and fat and bone to extract ballast a powerful aphrodisiac that somehow features heavily in commercial products. One of the strangest is a Coca-Cola product that has just a touch of ballast within it. By the way, that ballast is harvested from pools in the pit, some of which have been converted into fleshy spas. The effect is said to be so intense that before entering some of them, you must consult a doctor and a spiritual advisor. Full-scale extraction of the resources of the pit goes further. Biological computers are constructed out of nervous tissue. Pearls that are as hard as diamond and dozens of feet in diameter are pulled up from the surface, and more. It is an economic godsend for the small town of Gumption, which lays only 22 miles from the flesh pit, as it becomes a major hub for tourism. It is inextricable from the economics of the world, much to the chagrin of environmentalist groups such as Greenpeace, who protested the exploitation when the pit was first discovered, only to be ignored. And then 2007 happened. It's raining hard. The fireworks show planned for the 4th of July has been cancelled. You're angry, of course, you wanted to see that show, but the park has told you that it is extending its hours. Small compensation, but compensation nonetheless. So you go to the pit, the visitor center. You've done this before, but it's still unnerving. Like being swallowed, but everything is reinforced, right? You're fine. It's fine. The company surely did its due diligence. Then you hear the rumbling, the squelching of an organism moving. It sounds like the earth is choking around you, coughing and expelling fluid. As you scramble to get out, the organism's 
choking becomes more violent. Digestive juice and gastric excreta are pouring out of glands, bubbling and gurgling. Others get out. You're not so lucky. And as the visitor's center collapses, you, along with 700 others, lose light and stability and your lives. The hot, wet, acrid liquid pools around you. It's inevitable now you are being digested. Let's hope you were crushed by a beam first. It would be a mercy. But hey, chin up. At least you weren't trapped in the section of the pit called Oyster's Shame. Later news stories and government reports reveal their fate in detail. It took them 17 hours to be masticated, and they had radio contact with the outside world the whole time. 750 deaths, nearly 2,000 serious injuries, and tens of thousands experienced long-term psychological and medical damage, ranging from PTSD to birth defects from exposure to the waste of the monster, all caused by, when you think about the scale, what amounts to a cough in one's sleep. Too much water got in its gullet. But this wasn't just a freak accident. You see, the choke response was bad, but it could have been managed. What made it worse, what made it the disaster that it was, was not the choke response. It was the company response. To dump 22,000 liters of muscle toxin into the monster. Something they'd never done before, never tested before. Assumed that because it worked for animals, it would work for the flesh pit. It caused the creature to throw up, flooding the chamber. The visitor's lounge was in with acid and chime. They had neglected maintenance as well, ignored reports from the staff telling them about problems, struts that needed to be replaced, structural problems that couldn't be ignored. It was too costly for repair. It had not failed catastrophically yet, so what's the point in worrying? That is how businesses operate, cutting costs, slicing a tiny piece off the top, excising safety measures, try and maintain a bottom line. The company is, of course, shuttered. It's hard to advertise your flesh pit when millions of Americans saw people get consumed by it. And to make matters worse, the secondary, much more occult and esoteric contingency measure, the thing that put it back to sleep, is destroyed. All we have left is mitigation and hoping the worst case scenario doesn't happen. Unfortunately... The following message is transmitted at the request of the Texas Department of Public Safety, the United States Geological Survey, and the Permian Basin Recovery Corporation. The United States Geological Survey has issued a geobiological activity advisory for the following counties. Cook County, Gumption County, Howard County, Midland County, Sterling County, and Oak, 2 18 a.m. Central Daylight Time, at 10.48 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Seismic EKG monitoring stations detected muscle contractions originating from the northeastern limb of the Permian Basin superorganism. This event is expected to cause moderate to severe damage. All in all, what I find most compelling about the flesh pit is how easily it was integrated into very understandable and very human systems. Of course it's exaggerated, but there is something haunting about the flesh pit, how it was found and instantly people tried to figure out how they could exploit it, how the products were used and created to benefit people without any thought to consequences. Giant mineral pearls dug from the deepest depths, pheromones and aphrodisiacs slipped into Coca-Cola products, biological computers. But given the setting, doesn't it just seem so horrifying? As if no one, no human, would ever take the plunge. As if no one would ever be willing to work in conditions that anywhere near resembled that. Right? Have you heard of Nang Goldmine? It's in South Africa. In it, 
miners descend into the deepest, darkest depths of a still active mine. Over four kilometers down, surrounded by rock and dirt and gold. So much precious gold. The temperatures towards the bottom of the mine will reach nearly 66 degrees Celsius, 151 degrees Fahrenheit. It is dark, it is hot, it is moist. It requires protective protocols above that of a regular mining operation to work. Slurry ice is piped down to the bottom. Walls of concrete insulate the miners. In the cool places, it is a mere 30 degrees Celsius. It is hot sweaty, dangerous work. Extremophile organisms disconnected by terrestrial life by millions of years have been discovered there, living in the crevices and trapped water pockets of a hot, damp, oxygenless cave. Gold is used in computers, in attractive jewelry, in food preparation, dug out from the ground in hostile conditions, by workers who cited concerns for safety, both due to a pandemic in recent months, obviously, and chronically because the mines themselves are dangerous, run by companies that care far more for profit than safety. And nothing to me exemplifies this love of profit over safety like Crandall Canyon Mine. It was a coal mine in Utah, one of a few run by Murray Energy. In 2007, six workers were trapped, and the desperate attempt to rescue them resulted in three more dead. The bodies of the miners were never recovered. The mine had been sighted many times before for lack of safety. The owner, Robert Murray, said these citations were trivial. This, coupled with the foreknowledge of the mine owners had about the accidents, rock bursts, signs that the mine was dangerous, caused people to die. The government, after instant report, found that overestimations of the strength of the mine, overly aggressive mining practices, and company neglect all contributed to a horrific accident, leading to the government issuing its harshest fine to a mining company yet. And you know what? I'm going to stop beating around the bush. The flesh pit is in the Permian Basin for a reason. I do not think it is a coincidence that the horror story about the exploitation of humans, the use of migrant labor in unforgiving and outright deadly conditions, the potential destruction of life as we know it through tampering with nature in ways we don't understand, is situated in one of the major oil producing regions of Texas. There's a reason. And that reason is because the Permian Basin oil fields are rife with the exploitation of labor, with horrible accidents and deadly long-term health effects. Workers get exploited and fucked over by their employers, and some never come home. Oil refining plants leak benzene into the air, causing cancer and death. People too poor to move elsewhere or too desperate to keep searching for another job suffer the consequences, while the well-off can explore national parks and not notice the abuses that occur to produce the crude oil that make up our Coca-Cola bottles, our makeup, our gasoline. The flesh pit is deeply grounded in the real world, in labor exploitation and destruction of the natural world, and it was inevitable, following the discovery of the flesh pit, that something would go wrong. Something always goes wrong. By binding the flesh pit to the same logic, the same ideas, the same drive for profit and inevitable corporate negligence, what we got isn't just a fun sci-fi narrative about a strange beast living in the ground, it's not just a one-off horror story, but a full narrative that forefronts the human cost of industrial projects and hubris, of corporate greed and the rush to take any new discovery and make a profit from it. The Anodyne Corporation saw a great new scientific discovery, and to paraphrase the words of Dr. Ian Malcolm, before they even knew what they had, they bought the land rights for it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic bottle. And after the inevitable mistake, after it coughed and killed a thousand people, after the offending company was shuttered, we realized it was too late. 
the pit will wake up now. The exploitation of some strange, new, organic thing by industry, the cutting of corners, the overuse, it all culminated in a situation where the natural world has slipped from human grasp, where even the possibility of control is gone, and all that is left is mitigation, waiting for shit to inevitably hit the fan. Thank you for watching. Happy Halloween. If you liked the video, please like and subscribe, and if you really liked it, consider supporting me on Patreon, it would be a huge help. You can see the names of my current patrons rolling on by right now. I would particularly like to thank my $10 patron Patrick, and my $5 patrons Alicia Escapar and Rita Audrey Jones. That's all, thank you for watching, and again, Happy Halloween.